so great. All right, let's take our Bibles and go to Galatians chapter 4, if you would please. Yeah, we do want to, uh, we do want to invite you back tonight. Uh, Lord, Lord willing, I'll be preaching on the wisdom in the last days uh, out of the book of Daniel tonight. So I want to invite you back for that. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 4. And we're going to go to verse number 4 and just read the one verse. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. This morning I want to preach with God's help on the fullness of time. The fullness of time. It's something that, that God always waits for. If you, if you look all through the scriptures, if you've ever seen, you ever thought, well, what might God wait on? What would keep keeping him? What would, what, what would keep him from doing something? Because God does everything in the fullness of time. There has to be a complete, specific time. And then, then something happens. And so we want to look at that uh, with the Lord's help this morning. Heavenly Father, I pray now that you would bless this time uh, as we look at the fullness of time. Lord, I pray, Father, it would be a help. It would be a blessing. It would uh, open our eyes to some things. And uh, I pray, Father, that you would be in this time. Lord, take it, use it. Use me, Lord, in spite of myself. Help me, Lord, to... Convey this message clearly. I uh, pray, Father, for, uh, for us all to receive what you have for us today, uh, that it may benefit the kingdom of God. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Now, this verse that we just read in Galatians 4, 4, it's speaking of the first advent or the birth of Christ. The nation Israel had long expected uh, the seed of the woman that was their promised Messiah to come. And a little over 2,000 years ago, God fulfilled his promise of a savior of the world. Christ, he came at the right time. And he came the right way. He came the way that it was supposed to be. He, he also came in the, the uh, complete fulfillment of prophecy. You look and you'll see a specific time that something was prophesied, and you'll also see a specific time that, that, that it was fulfilled right up into the coming of, the, of Christ. You'll see it over and over and over in the scripture. And so there are, there are just loads of things that were prophesied that actually came true that, that, that have come, and it was all at a specific time time and not only did Christ come right but he lived right he died right he resurrected right he did all things right and I said all that to say this that everything comes to pass in the fullness of time uh, when we see this too shall pass there's a time specifically that it will right uh, there's, there's time frames for things like that. Now, the Bible declares that there is a season for every purpose under heaven uh, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Now, all seasons change. We know that, uh, you know, except, you know, sometimes we'll get four seasons in one day. I've, I've lived to see those days in Michigan. Where it, it literally snowed, it rained, it sunshined, I mean, it, went th it went through everything, and it got hot. I'm like, really? Four seasons in one day. People are going to be messed up, but that's, that's, that's part of living in Michigan. You know, one man said that good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people, but neither one of them will stay that way. Just because something good happens to somebody that's, that's a bad person or something bad happens to a good person doesn't mean, you know, like, it, it, you know, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. It doesn't matter who's standing outside. 
you're getting wet. That's all there is to it. So you're going to get rain. It rains on everybody. You're both soaked. But you're not going to stay that way. So neither, does, neither to say that just because something bad happens doesn't mean that it's going to stay that way. So there's no need to, to live like that or to, to, to be uh, in, in, in that kind of mindset. Now, there are dispensations that are mentioned in the Bible. We did go through some of those uh, in years past. Uh, there are specified administrations or stewardships uh, or economies. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, the Bible says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So these dispensations, they all have a time limit. They have a time limit. There's a time it starts, and there's a time it ends, and there's a time that when this one ends, and it's time for the next one to begin. All right, that's how we are. We're in the sixth dispensation, and so we're waiting for the seventh, right? We're waiting for the, the, the fullness of time to come for, for Christ to be here and uh, to come and to get us. Now, the phrase fullness of time means that uh, there is an allotted time for a certain event to run its course, and then an expected action is required by God to end that event. Okay? So, we got to understand that everything has a time limit on it. We are in time. God is actually above time. But like I tried to explain it one time like this because to me it makes the most sense like this. That you know how everything's written is written. There's no changing it. If you look at everything as though it were something on a video or a, 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 or a CD or whatever. And you put it in the DVD player, right? And you have your movie. It goes from beginning. See, you've got ads in it, some of them. Uh, and commercials at the beginning of them. Uh, so everything is recorded. Everything is done. It's all said and done. You don't go back in after it's done and make changes. After it's done and it's been put out to the public, there's no changes that are made. Okay? So everything's recorded. And you can see the timeline that, oh, well, we're this, at this point in this time in that section, uh, you know, go to minute 28 and 30 seconds and you'll see this. A lot of young people, you do that with videos, right? Some, sometimes or YouTube or whatever. You, you can look at certain things. Well, it's boring up to this part. Hey, skip up to this, this particular time and you'll see this particular thing because it's recorded at that time. I like to think of this whole thing is already being recorded because it was in the book. It wasn't recorded on DVD for us, but it was recorded the same way, only in book form. Specific time that things happen. You know, in God's timeline, 10 years ago, I was still right here in this spot talking to every single one of you. I was already here doing it. That's what the Bible means when it says we're, we're seated or we're already seated in heavenly places. We're already there. We just haven't got to that point in the time. Okay, you see what I'm saying? If we were to fast forward, now what was cool is what I brought out about, about John is that he was from our past and he got pulled into our future where we were at in heaven and wrote everything down that from, from the beginning and then took it back to the past with them. And then it all went into the Bible so that we would all know what God has said in his book for a time to come. He uses that phrase a lot in the Bible because he wants us to understand that it's written, it's done. It's done already. And that's why we can sing, I'm redeemed, although the physical redemption hasn't taken place. It, it, it's taken place over here. Or actually, it might be like right here. 
because we're real close to it. Yeah, we might just be like, we might just be a little lean from glory. It's almost there. It's almost time. The fullness of time when that happens, that is when he'll come. Every moment of our lives, it, it's recorded. But you know what? The people in the movie that are making those scenes, that are shooting that, they don't know where it's at. And when you look, when you're watching a film, the people don't know ahead of time who the killer is or who, you know, who the bad guy was or how, what's going to come up here. They're living in this moment, in this time, because that's where it's at. That's why those scenes are just playing, and you don't know anything else about what's coming because you haven't seen it. And that's what's difficult sometimes about the Bible is because we haven't seen some things yet, like in Revelation, we haven't seen some of those things yet, so it's kind of baffling. It's a little bit confusing sometimes to read this and read that. And you can go back to the Old Testament and you can get kind of weirded out by some of the things that are there because you've never seen. You've never seen it because you're still in this time. You're not over there yet, okay? You weren't there when it was written, but you are after, okay? I want us to kind of gather kind of like a, a better way to think about it. And that's why God can't change his word because that would be like going back in and redoing the whole thing. You can't do that. It's already done. What's written is written. And even Pilate said that. When he wrote, he, he, he wrote on there what they wanted to have on there. And, oh, no, don't put on there. No, what's written is written. Over and over, when Jesus refuted the devil when he was tempting him, what did he say? It is written. It cannot be changed. It is in print. It is already done. And it's no wonder Jesus could say it is finished. He knew what was coming. It's finished. And he gave. Now, as, as finite beings, we don't know the exact length of these events unless it's specified in the Bible. Acts 1, 7, and he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. And God the Father has reserved that. That specific fullness of time will be told. He has reserved that for himself. All right, so I want to give you a, a, a few things here this morning, um, just a few things that will run their course in time, okay? Now, in the fullness of time, sin will run its course. It will run its course. James 1, 15, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Though a sinner live a hundred years, the Bible says, it will not be well with him. A person may seem to get away with sinfulness for a while, but it will come to a devastating end. Uh, last Wednesday, we were talking about, we finished up on the doctrine of sin. And Lord willing, we're going to be starting the doctrine of the Holy Spirit on Wednesday. So if you can be here, we want to encourage you to be here for that. Secondly... The fullness of time, in the fullness of time, salvation's call will also run its course. All right? Now, in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6, it, the Bible says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Now, that gives you an indication that there might be a time when you went go to call that he wouldn't be there to hear that he wouldn't be near to answer. So we need to do it while he's here in the time that we have. All right? 
That is an important, the Bible says redeeming the time because the days are evil. There's an important lesson there. A lot to do with time. Today, now is the day of salvation. There's no promise of a tomorrow or another chance for anyone. We all need to get ourselves ready to meet him. Thirdly, in the fullness of time, I like this one, sorrow will run its course. Sorrow will run its course. Now, in Psalms chapter 30, verse 5, it says, For his anger endureth but a moment, in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And I've found that time is a great healer. No matter how great the loss, there are still going to be better days ahead. Also, I wanted to mention this too. Uh, all right, no, I already did. Okay, we're good. Uh, in fullness of time, sickness will run its course. I don't guess anybody likes to be sick. Right, especially nowadays, it's not that great. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's going to run its course. Psalm 103.3, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Now, one way or another, God will physically or eternally heal us. Now, just because if, if you pray for somebody and, uh, you know, and, and I've always explained it this way as well, that you need to pray in the will of God as to what happens. There's been a lot of times that we've prayed for people and God took them home because, you know what, their body was really just not in a place where God, it was, the full, it was their time. The fullness of time will come for us. When our time is done. And, and so God did heal those people. God did answer that request to, 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 to heal them and make them better in that instance. Because when they're absent from the body and present with the Lord when they're saved. That's a great thing. So that's all going to run its course as well. And I'm glad for that. We live in a world where, where sickness is rampant. And, you know, I mean, it, it, it always has. There's always been sickness. It's not like it's a new thing. There's always been sickness. And there will be sickness until it's run its course and it won't be no more. I look for the day. I've said many, many times what makes heaven. The, the, there's a, so much more that make heaven heaven by what will not be there versus what is there. There won't be. I mean, that's what we get excited about. We, we start thinking about, oh, well, there'll be, no, there'll be no sickness. There'll be no sadness. There'll be no sorrow. There'll be no suffering. There'll be no tears. There'll be no pain. There'll be no, uh, there'll be no more goodbyes. Well, you're getting all excited about won't be, what won't be there. That's what you're getting excited over because you don't have any idea what that's like to, to not have to get sick ever, to not ever cry, to not ever feel sad, to not ever be anxious, to not ever have any of those problems and issues and things of life, to never have another pain as long as you, as long as forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever on, on and on and on. We have no idea what that is like. And so that will make heaven awesome. And those are really the things, if you think about it, the, the, the thing that we use the most to try to tell people about heaven is also those things that will not be there. We use that more than any other thing more than God's going to be there. Oh, I don't know. Who, I've never met him. I mean, I don't know. Well, you need to meet him. But, but they, have, they, they don't know the, the physical presence of God. We feel him. We know he's here. We know he's in this room right now with us. 
We know he's here because he promised that he would be if two or three are gathered together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There will I be in the midst of them. He's here because he's promised, because it's written. It can't be changed. It can't be changed. That what we do to other people is tell them what won't be there. And that is used to try to, you know, build in them this desire to want to go. Because, I mean, who really wouldn't want to be without all those things? I mean, logically, would you like to go to a place of nothing but pain, torture? Hey, you know, I'm loading up a people to go and jump into the furnace. Uh, come on, come on and go with me. I don't think I'm going to get too many riders. I don't think too many people are going to sign up to go jump in the furnace. Nobody loves me that much. I love you, but not that much. I'm not willing to go burn for you. Think about it. That's what we use. We use those types of things to help others understand why heaven is going to be good because it's all we can understand. We have not seen or heard. It's not entered into our heart the things that he's prepared. We don't even know about the rest of it. All we have is what we know. And we know what isn't going to be there. Now, he's given us a chapter and a half of what is going to be there. But even in that chapter and a half is the things that are not going to be there. <laughs> Okay, so I'm not trying to confuse you. I'm trying to help you. That's how we do things. That's how we get people uh, to, to try to see because that's all we see. All right, so sickness will run its course. Uh, in the fullness of time, fifthly, suffering will run its course. First Peter 1 6, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. All right, circumstances are going to change for those who suffer. Life is often a roller coaster. It's got highs, it's got lows, and sometimes it'll flip you upside down. It'll do that to you. There's mountaintops and there's valleys. There's good and there's bad, and, and, and it's, all, it's, it's all there. But all of that, any kind of suffering, that's all going to come to an end. It'll, it, the fullness of time happens, it's done. Sixthly, in the fullness of time, Satan's reign will run its course. I like that one. Yeah. Troublemaker no longer. I like it. I like it a ton. Revelation 12, 12, therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth he hath but a short time. And there's coming a day when his power and his influence will no longer be. It won't be there. Hell was prepared for him and the, those angels that followed him and left their place in heaven. And the time of their incarceration is also getting nearer. See, you have to understand something else. As exciting as the promise and the idea is of Jesus coming and very, very soon is to us, the more terrified the devils become because their time is shortening fast, quicker and quicker and quicker. We're getting closer to heaven. They're getting closer to the lake of fire. Which means the, that means more pressure on them to wreak havoc. More pressure on them to destroy homes, to destroy lives, to destroy your, your peace. And to try to hurt the church of God as much as it possibly can. And take down as many people as he possibly can. That pressure keeps on going. It's there. 
It's constant. It's 24 hours a day, tw- you know, seven days a week. It doesn't take vacations. It doesn't take rest. It doesn't take time off. It's constant. They don't have time to waste. Would to God Christians would get the same mindset and urgency that the demons have. Amen. That would be a great and wonderful thing in this day. If we could act for God and for good with the same purpose, determination, and drive that the demons are trying to destroy it, man, what a world we could have. Seriously. It would be amazing. Seventh, in the fullness of time, states will run their course. Psalms 9.17, I mentioned this as well uh, before last week. But the wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. God sets up nations and he can also take them down. It said they're going to be turned into hell. Empire after empire has risen and to its zenith of power only to fall. America better take note of the great empires that went before her that dropped. Pride cometh before the fall. That's an unfortunate thing, but that's the way it is. And lastly, in the fullness of time, this sin-cursed world will run its course. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10 through 12. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. This wonderful world will be once again as it was in the beginning, and we'll be home. We'll be home where we belong, our real home. You know, that driveway you drive up into and the house you walk into, that's not our home. It's not our home. It's just the house. It's just the dwelling. We'll be home. That's going to be a wonderful, wonderful thing. And the Lord will come again. And it could be today. It might be today. Wouldn't that be, this would be a great day for the Lord to come back. Any day he would. I'm excited about it. You could be excited about it. Now, should it encompass all of our thoughts and actions to the point that we just sit around and look up and, you know, sit up and look at the sky constantly, 24-7? No, we're not getting nothing done for God that way. But we need to be watchful. Which means, you know what, we need to be ready. And the best thing to do when you know somebody's coming is you want to get yourself ready so that it's good when they come. You know, when you have a guest over, you want them to come into a clean house. You want them to, you want to make sure you have food and provisions. You want to make sure everything's nice. You got the candles lit. You got everybody has got the, everything goes crazy. And we're, we're dusting and mopping and sweeping and vacuuming. And, you know, finally taking care of that cobweb that's been there for like eight months. And we just didn't care. But now we do. Y'all been there. We've all been there. Come on, we're people. It's not always great to have to deal with those things, but we do. Why? Why do we go through all that? Because we want it to be a nice experience and the person to be pleased whom we are expecting. 
So why not Jesus? Why don't we have the same things preparing for his coming that we do our family or someone we invite over from the church or some stranger that you know, we, we happen to take in for a meal, somebody you, you invite a coworker over. You know, why don't we do that for Jesus? Is he not worthy of that? He's worthy of more than that. He's worthy of much more than we'll ever give him. That's something to think about, folks. Will Jesus be pleased when he comes? Will it be an experience that he is excited about and happy to find the condition of where he's come to? That's what we need to work on. Making our house, getting our house in order. I think that's one of the reasons that God used that analogy in the Bible is to get our house in order because that's how God wants to find it when he comes. Getting ready to meet him. Getting ready for him to, to be here because he will. We don't know when. You know, it's a lot easier with people because you know a place and a time and you know all that. It's a little weird, and it's harder because it, it involves a lot more work to keep your house, like, ex constantly expecting somebody to drop by any moment. But if we all lived in our houses like someone that we, we know is just going to show up on our door at any given time and moment, and we want to make sure that it's ready and nice and presented at all times, you know, I know people that have at least one room in the front of their house where the door is that's immaculate at any time so someone could just be stopped right there, sat down, and, and you know, and, and that's good. But we need to keep our lives that way because of we were expecting him to come. Are you expecting him to come? Amen. Well, let's be ready for it, amen? Let's be ready for it. How important is it to be ready? We need to be ready. Most certainly, we do. And I'm going to have a Sister Kale come, if she would, please. And we're going to have our invitation.